remain. This is an estate where people dump their where children play dangerous games unsupervised. Where gun attacks are becoming common. Where the evidence of drug abuse is all around. where desperately needed houses are torn down. Where lawlessness and crime seem out of control. Monsell lies two miles north of Manchester's centre, near the proposed Olympic Stadium site. The main road, linking the city with Rochdale, is to its west, the Oldham Road to the east. The estate was built in the 60s, for families moved in slum clearance. 1,800 people live here now. There are 175 houses, 190 masonettes and flats, three tower blocks, a small central shopping area, and a primary school. A hundred old terraces on the estate's northern edge also belong to the city council. The first wave of tenants moved on to Monsell together from nearby streets where houses were demolished so that a sense of community lost in some other parts of the city was kept alive here. In the 60s, Wilson's Brewery on the outskirts of the estate was the main employer. It closed in 1986 with the loss of a thousand jobs leaving a small distribution centre and 80 staff. Today, unemployment on Monsell is running at 58%, and 7 out of 10 have incomes low enough to qualify for housing benefit. The close-knit community feels itself under threat from a new generation of tenants and their children, whose behaviour is quite literally destroying whole areas of the estate. The first target was the older houses, concentrated in four streets at the northern end. Less than 24 hours after the tenants moved out, thieves moved into this house and ripped out some copper piping to sell for scrap. Houses flooding from their front doors are a common sight. The work of the next group in the chain of destruction can be seen in the houses left empty for longer. Damage is on such a scale that they're beyond repair. They were fitted with new central heating systems by the council only 10 years ago. The backyards attract fly tippers and have inspired a new children's game, hunting for rats. This hay bed have been nesting. There's one of the nests here. Abandoned and filthy, the terraces are a meeting point for drug users who leave them littered with syringes. In one property alone, we counted at least two dozen. The terraces have been sold by the council to a housing association. They'll soon be demolished and new homes built in their place. There are still some families waiting to move out. Next door, this one, it's been like that for months. The kids are in there all the time. They've set a light to it once. It's been flooded out. It's, it's full of pins, needles, off the druggies. You know, the windows go through straight away as soon as someone moves. The radiators are ripped out, everything's gone, stripped out, boilers, everything. Why do you think it is? No idea, really. It's just... It's just the way people live round here. Right. They, they've got nothing to do, they've got no job. They're probably scrapping the radiators for money. Who is it who does the wrecking? It's mostly just the kids. It's like people say there's nothing for them to do. There used to be a park over there. It's not there anymore. So they're bored. The destruction of the terraces started about five years ago when damp problems developed and they became difficult to let. A relatively quick turnover of tenants created a steady supply of empty houses. People on other parts of the estate hoped that theft and vandalism would be limited to these older properties. Two years ago, 
they saw it spread to the estate's central area, where good quality family homes are stripped of anything valuable, then torn apart by children. When these pictures were taken, one family remained in this row of four houses. It was just everything. Smashed the windows, doors come off, everything. Four boards came out, a lot, just wrecked everything. And they just thought it was fun, just a game. So then, it was not. And this is how I've had to live, like this, through it all. I've had water. We've had the water board out, I don't know how many times to turn it off. Direct words have been out to board them up, and as soon as they've been out, they're back again. It's just pointless. And as soon as they do the job, they're back again. They just, and I think they're fed up of it. And as soon as they, the water goes off, that's back on. They turned it off from the main, they switched it on. So where they're getting the, the things from to turn the water on, I haven't got a clue. They're just turning it on. And, and it's just annoying sometimes that you see these properties being wet like they are. When you've got families who are waiting for the house. In order to repair the damage, Manchester City Council had to build a security fence and provide a 24-hour guard so that the cost of halting the destruction will exceed the value of the houses. So far, about 80 terraces have been rendered uninhabitable, plus many of the newer houses and flats in six streets in the middle of the estate. There are still well-kept areas left, but it's calculated that this cycle of stealing and wrecking has now left its mark on three out of four Monsell streets. As the estate's gone down, many of the original tenants have moved out. Fraser Williams grew up on Monsell, moving from his parents' house to a one-bedroom flat. He left a year ago, driven out, he claims, by children. We used to get people out on the front, and like they'd sweep the old length of this, you know, because it was proud of the estate, like, um, everyone done the bit now, they throw bin bags out over the fences and things like that. You see front doors opening, bin bags literally come flying out, you know what I mean? They just don't care. The kids, as soon as someone moved, break the boards off, go in, rip the boiler out. When I lived here, um, twice I got flooded out. I used to live on the very end, got flooded out of there, so they moved me up to number six. Got flooded out there within a month. So, I mean, it's not as if I'm a old woman or nothing. I was coming out and chasing them off, but, you know what I mean? You're so plus, you can't, you can't win. Many a time I've come out, dragged a kid round to his mum and says, look, he's been doing such and such a thing. And she said, oh, right. You know what I mean? It really gets to you, I mean, I've been... I said, I want something that's done about it now, and like, oh, right, yeah, get him. They don't, they don't care, they don't care. In St Augustine's primary school at the heart of the estate, truancy isn't a problem. Records show only one case last year, so any vandalism by the younger age group must be happening out of school hours. Pupils and teachers here work closely with the council and tenants association on a series of improvement projects and anti-crime initiatives. There have been numerous clean-up campaigns. The most recent lasted a month and every item of refuse was removed. Within weeks though, the rubbish was back. The head teacher believes some of the problems lie with the transient group. While numbers of pupils at the school have remained steady, the register shows that a teacher with a class of 30 will in fact probably teach about 40 children during the school year. It's calculated that a third of Monsell's tenants are now just passing through. There's a large core. This is home for them, this is community for them. They've been here a long time. But for others, it's, it's, they're not here long. But if if you, when you go to any area, if you're not sure whether you're stopping or you know that you're not stopping, I think your commitment to it is obviously going to be different to um, the people who are there all the time. In some ways, I suppose it's a bit like holiday resorts. You know, they, you get the lager louts when they go on holiday to Benidorm for a fortnight. They're only, they know they're only there for a fortnight. So behaviour is slightly different to, it would, to perhaps it would be at home. How aware are the children about the, the drug problem on the estate? Oh, very aware. Very aware. Um, th th they know it happens, they see the druggies um, out on the streets. Um, at this age, children have also got a great moral awareness and they feel it is wrong. 
and they're very aware of the dangers. And if they see any syringes about, they tell somebody. Why then do you think that some of the children from this school go on to take drugs when they're just a, just a little bit older? You get to the stage where you're getting towards the end of secondary school. Um, you may not be attending as much as you should be doing. Um, there's no future for employment. There's no money to go out and do what would be seen as sort of traditional ways to spend your time going out to clubs and this sort of thing. And drugs is a very cheap way of getting what some people feel is a pleasurable experience. Um, and younger ones have always been through history very strongly influenced by older peers. The children from here, there's one just gone into, just got started university this year who went through this school. Um, we've got a girl who went through the school in a direct grand grammar school. Um, so children achieve. I don't look at them and think your lot isn't that good. The potential for any child around here is the same for any other. It's whether they can overcome the pressures, which by and large are peer pressures. Homes on Monsell are hard to let. And like councils across the country, Manchester's under pressure to reduce the number of vacancies or risk losing government grant. Applicants who'd normally be unsuccessful can have a council property if they'll agree to live here. It's a process which does nothing to weed out potential problem tenants or to limit their numbers in any one area. In addition, councils have a legal duty placed on them by central government to house families with children. On estates like Monsell, the combination of central and local government housing policy in effect dumps an aggressively anti-social minority among those least equipped to deal with them. Jim Hagen keeps a greyhound, a lurcher, two Jack Russell Terriers and several ferrets. A woman living nearby told us the crying of the ferrets keeps her awake at night, but claimed she was too frightened to be interviewed. Mr. Hagen sees nothing wrong in having so many pets in the tiny garden of a one-bedroom council flat. Well, look at Pandas, it's all about everything. Are they noisy? No. Only when people start banging on the gate, the dogs will start barking and that's it. What do you use the ferrets and the jackasses and the lurches for? Rabbit. Hunting rabbits. Rats. Do the neighbours ever complain? No. Driving through the estate, we disturb this group of youngsters, crashing tubes of plastic piping on the ground. In their midst, a frightened old man. His home, the last still occupied in a row of terraces, is a regular target. A neighbour had also come out to intervene. No, I've just seen them messing about with him. You know what? They're asking him, so... Yeah. He wanted to take the photos of them, really, and put them on TV. He was doing us a lot of hassle. It was these two. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not you, Mum. They were, they smashed his window there. <laughs> 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 they smashed his shed. <laughs> They're all coming out. <laughs> this boy showed us how the piping was being used to assault the elderly man when we arrived on the scene. Since we filmed this incident, the elderly man has died. The primary school has been attacked by youths with guns. This led to an increased police presence on the estate. A couple of youths apparently walked around the path that goes around the perimeter fence of the school and shot out school windows on the way around. And seen by one of the parents who tried to phone the police and were put on hold on a 999 call and in the end gave up. Um, and the police never arrived. And it took, them, it took these youths long enough to walk around that if, if they had responded, they could have caught the people doing it. Now that, I think, was probably the low point of relationships with the police in some ways. Why do you so think the police weren't responding? The telephone system can't cope with the number of phone calls they get, they tell me. Um, so they, they're having to change that, and I think they've actually changed it now. And another reason we were given is that they staff areas according to demand, and the demand is based on the number of calls made. 
And in an area like this, people tend not to call the police, so the police feel that there isn't a big need for a big presence, so it doesn't get priority. Why do you think people are not reporting crime in an area like this? Well, I think it's a certain chicken and egg. You, if, if nobody responds, you, you're wasting your time reporting it anyway, because nothing will be done. So police statistics say it's not a, statistically, it's not a crime area. So we don't need to worry too much. So we get self-fulfilling prophecy. Police think it's not that important, and the residents think it's not that important. A young woman threatened us with what appeared to be a gun as we filmed from the top of one of the estate's tower blocks. We were later told the block had been used for police surveillance on a heroin dealer. Bullet holes scar the windows of a centre for the mentally handicapped. The Peter Pan Centre was founded by four mothers struggling to cope with profoundly disabled children. Seventeen years on, it's a permanent service funded by Manchester City Council. Run by parents, for parents, the centre's offered help and support to 500 families. Keep going, keep jumping. Come here, right round there. Keep going. Come back, jump. Andrew, 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 jump, jump. The Peter Pan Centre was moved to the Monsell Estate when its base in the city centre was demolished to make way for a superstore. In its old location, some honour amongst thieves meant the centre was left alone. Here, it's been burgled so many times, it can't be insured. During the last break-in, a trolley for taking this little girl, Claire Parker, into the sea on summer trips was used to ferry items across the road. Then it was smashed up. It had cost Claire's mother, a single parent, £200, and she couldn't afford to replace it. Claire has a trolley today only because when another severely disabled child died, her parents donated hers. Since we moved in five years ago, we've had about 16 break-ins and three times they cleared us out, and I mean cleared us out. The carpets, the pictures off the wall, the telephones, tables, three-piece suites, fridges, everything, absolutely everything. And, and it was quite devastating, really. I mean, if anybody watching this programme who, who does happen to be one of the thieves that broke in, and I'm being perfectly honest when I say to you, it's not us you stole from. <laughs> it isn't us. It's, it's people who can't chase you because they can't walk. And it's people who can't call you because they can't talk. And it's people who will forgive you. That's who you stole. And if you've got a problem with drugs or whatever, we understand that as well. We understand that as well. So on the days when you're not drugged up or you, you, you haven't, you, you're looking at your problem a bit more reasonable, can you maybe think of us then? Do you know who it is who's stealing from you? Well, um, we don't actually know them. Um, but they were that, they were that hard, well, cheeky really. Apparently they were selling what they'd stole on the estate while the policeman was writing down here what was stolen. Why do you think they do it? I think they do it, and this is only my opinion, right? I think since the laws changed from DSS, at one time young people was able to get grants and start in a flat of their own, you know? Because you all grow up, you all become adult, and then you don't get on with your mum and dad. But I think a lot of the kids now, there's no grants. There's nothing to help them to leave the family home, to start up. So I think they come out and they get with the peers, and they, they might not be bad kids who want to go drugging it or, or drinking it. But I think all the substances have done all this. All the, you know, the bringing in of the drugs and everything. What do you think we can do? as a society to try to put this right? Oh God, that's a big question, really. Uh, I don't think I really know the answer. I really don't. But I'll tell you what we do here, right. Now we advocate in this centre, you get it right in your own four walls. Don't put a different hat on when you come out the door. Get it right with your own family. And if everyone swept outside their own front door, the world would be clean. The world would be clean. And that's all we need to do, see to your own home. Not what she's doing next door or the ever, but if you got it right in your own home first, it'd be right. It would be right. So that's all we've got to do, really. <laughs> Thank you.
At a children's disco in the estate's community centre, efforts are made to drive home an anti-drugs message. Education's a must. Stay away from drugs. And if you ever see me on the street, don't be afraid to ask me. Go on, what time is it? The disco marks the end of a summer play scheme. Run with the help of volunteers, it aims to keep children safe and out of trouble during the school holidays. A council grant pays the wages of two community workers who organise events here. There are clubs for children, pensioners and the unemployed. During the five weeks of the play scheme, two additional staff are taken on. This chance of work is a reward for young people who help out unpaid all year round. Gary Jones is one of this year's play scheme workers. He stopped going to school regularly when he was 14, and after leaving a year ago, he's drifted in and out of low-paid work. He's convinced that for many young people on the estate, the descent into drugs and crime is the inevitable consequence of long-term unemployment. If you've got no money, <coughs> you've got a wife and a kid and whatever, you've got to get some money from somewhere, haven't you? And if you can't get it like on the straight and narrow, obviously you're going to have to go thieving for it or whatever is going on at the time. It's just part of life, isn't it? If you can't get it on the street, you've got to go and get it some other way. Do you think that lots of people make that decision now? Yeah, I know a lot of people. A great deal, yeah. There's still a few that, like, don't really want to do it, but quite a lot of people are just doing it, not thinking about it. And, and, and what do they say to you? What are the people who are going out for you, then? Oh, it's one of them, mate. Oh, it's great, yeah. There's loads of money here and loads of money there and all this lot and all that lot. So there's always... The, the temptation's always there to go and do it because you think, well, if they're doing so good at it, I could do just as good as them at it. So... And I could have just as much money as all them lot. At a City Council housing committee, two long-standing Monsell residents have come to monitor progress in the latest attempts to halt the estate's decline. For the third year running, the Monsell Tenants Association and the Council are bidding for estates action funding from the government. It's money set aside for problem estates. Mr Chairman, can I come in on this one for Monsell and Colliers, please? That uh, most of the tenants have been consulted about the estate action bid on several occasions, and most members and the families on Monsell, you know, are in agreement to try and go ahead with the estate action bid. And hopefully, we are going to be priority number one on this list, because this is our third attempt to try and get the estate action bid. In the past, despite assurances from civil servants that theirs was an excellent bid, Monsell has been rejected. It's currently at the top of the council's priority list. Uh, we're submitting all the fees on the basis that Monsell is our number one priority for spending. So I hope that's reassuring. Rose McCartan and Nellie Wade are among a core of tenants committed to the estate's future. After seeing the destruction spread from the terraces to the centre of the estate, they want action while there are still some well-kept areas left. I challenge the government ministers, Robert Key, the, the head of the Department of the Environment, anybody, you come down to the Monsell Estate, you see how we're living and you see how we want to live. We've not chosen to be in this position. We are the result of years of jobs being lost. Um, local authorities being starved of cash. We are the result of all this. So, no, you come down onto Monsell Estate, you'll see what we've been doing for the past ten years. We've not been sat on our backsides. I mean, we've had, we've had our clean-up campaigns, our public meetings, and done our best to try and turn things around. But at the end of the day, it takes money. And if people aren't prepared to invest their money in us, well then, the government, the responsibility of what happens on Mons lies with the government. If the estate succeeds this time, money will be spent correcting some of the design faults at its centre where it's thought families with children are concentrated too closely together. The number of flats will be reduced, while those remaining will be improved. Masonettes will have the tops removed 
recreating houses with gardens. All secluded walkways will be opened out. There are doubts, though, about how long any improvements would last if some of the worst behaviour continues unchecked. A condition of estates action funding is increased tenant participation in the management of estates. Whether the Monsell bid succeeds or not, some think a partial solution could lie with a policy to vet new tenants and to strictly enforce tenancy agreements. The rules are in the rent book, so therefore it's up to the housing people to make sure these rules are adhered to. It tells you about keeping animals. It tells you about the cleanliness. It tells you about keeping your gardens tidy. But very few people take notice of that. Do you think realistically that the council could enforce those rules? They should be able to. I still think that when a tenant gets a tenancy of a house, that the housing department should take more time to go through the rules and regulations for this tenant up to a tenant. Do they understand about keeping of animals? Do they understand about keeping gardens tidy? Do they, uh, do they understand about the noise, you know, which some people have to put up with? Because <clears throat> I do know one family <coughs> that they're in bed at 11 o'clock, say 11 o'clock at night, but at half past 12 that they're in discos. <laughs> and it happens pretty regular. But how far can a tenancy agreement influence people who seem to be without any regard for their neighbours? And how far is it possible to change attitudes which have taken years to develop and harden? In Monsell's case, if a state's action funding is given, things will improve. Experience has shown that investing in rundown estates can succeed in attracting more responsible tenants. And if in the future the tenants of Monsell have a say in who's given a home here, they'll surely weed out the worst elements. At the end of the process, though, since councils are a local...